Thanks to Acast for hosting and monetizing the podcast. Oh, hi. Hello there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, the one who likes to curse and make bigots angry. (laughs) And here I am again today with a magnificent and so very fun conversation episode, or in this case, the second ever two-part conversation episode. I spoke with Eduardo Garcia Molina, perhaps best known for providing otter photos and memes on Classics Twitter, and also the less adorable but even more interesting Hellenistic period, and the Seleucids specifically within that period, Eduardo studies and is deeply knowledgeable about the wonders of the Hellenistic period that's so often forgotten when we talk about the ancient world because, as he calls it, it suffers from middle child syndrome, that time between the height of classical Greece, the rise of Alexander the Great, and the later Roman Empire. And we talked about it forever. It was so much fun and so interesting. These episodes are the perfect examples of how much I love to just sit back and let scholars talk, share whatever fascinating things come to their minds about their specialties. This episode is also somewhat unique because it's deeply about the history, the historical period broadly, kind of everything that was taking place during the Hellenistic period, a period that I notoriously am bad at utilizing because I know so little about it. And like my mythological obsessions tend to lie in the archaic and classical period. So while I'll read you all things and sources from the Hellenistic, I don't know much about it. But turns out the Hellenistic period is so, so fascinating because everything changed in the ancient world and everything expanded and grew. There was so much interaction between the Greeks and the wider Mediterranean world and beyond. Granted, because this was a particularly imperial time, but still. There's so much to say about the Hellenistic period in the East, so much beyond Greece and Rome. Now, why am I even vaguely trying to explain the intricacies of the Hellenistic period when I could just direct you straight into this episode because it's wonderful? But also, Eduardo joined me to talk about video games that feature the ancient world, so that's kind of how we begin things. Video games beyond AC Odyssey, because there are others, even if all I talk about is Odyssey. We talk Rome, Total War, and beyond. We talk otters briefly and memorably. Eduardo provides the podcast's first ever Spanish content. Conversations, the Hellenistic period and its middle child syndrome with Eduardo Garcia Molina. Spanish is my first language. (laughs) You will hear me say Spanish. Oh, I've noticed a lot of it. It's great. I love it. I do that with, like, I'm not French, but I grew up in, or I'm, like, not grew up, but, like, I grew up in a French family, and I'm from Quebec, but, like, I barely speak French, but I use a lot of, like, weird French words in my sentences as if they're English, and so I love that. You definitely use a lot more than I do, but I... (laughs) Yeah, I I was born uh, in Puerto Rico, and uh, we moved when I was 10 years old. Oh, okay, Um, yeah. And the the Caribbean especially, they really like, because of course, we're under the umbrella of uh, the the American Empire since 1898, well before that, but especially Cuba and Puerto Rico after 1898. Um, but, But there's a lot of, like, Spangly. Uh, 
you're gonna call it Spanglish, but it's like you just naturally incorporate it into your. And there's so much slang. That's one of the things that I actually study, that I've gotten more and more into. Uh, especially again now that I'm out of coursework, now that I can breathe a little bit. One of my interests, aside from you know the Seleucids, which is my main thing, but I've been writing and researching more and more on the reception of classics in like the Caribbean, mm. especially. Yeah, I just like I submit an abstract. No que madera, si Dios quiere, uh, it's going to be accepted for SCS in uh, New Orleans, looking at Cuban adaptations of Greek tragedies uh, and cool. using Cuban slang and musical cues and costuming and humor to kind of, como que se dice, to, so, to, to subvert like the, the traditional oh, classics is for the elite, like, because this, especially in, like, uh, the colonial settings of, of Cuba and Puerto Rico, that was a way that Spanish elites could differentiate themselves is through a classical education. And mm. you see this in America still. Uh, so nothing, not much has changed. In Britain, mm -hmm. uh, you still, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, pero, yeah, especially in, like, the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, you start seeing these adaptations that like poke fun, that play around with Greek myths and interject just like, there's actually a, um, a Cuban adaptation of the Odyssey called La Odilea that uses like super slangy Cuban. Like, like don't get me wrong, my family is mostly from Cuba and then we moved to Puerto Rico. So like, if I speak Spanish, you will hear that coming out of me, but like some of those slangs are like super specific regions in Cuba, but it's super targeted for a general audience coming out of the, the uh, increased social pressures of the 50s and 60s in Cuba, especially mm -hmm. like with the revolution and everything, making classics and making these things available to all. And you have these, uh, yeah, like it, it's super like down to earth, low slang. Uh, yeah. It, but yeah, the stuff like that, I've been able to to research more now that I'm in my fourth year and really get to write on that. I'm, I'm, I'm I, I have a secret abstract that I'm currently writing uh, for Ooh. this conference on like classical reception in porn. <laughs> uh, That's a yeah. thing. I mean, of yeah. course it's a thing now that I hear it. Like, of course it is, but wow. C, C, C. So, I, uh, because then I can talk about, like, El Colloquio de los Centauros, which is Dario, uh, a famous poet. He writes this Colloquium of the Centaurs that is just this wonderfully beautiful poem that has just centaurs talking amongst themselves. Mm. In Spanish, there is so many ancient references. It's absolutely, like, it's so thick with ancient references. Um, it's like if you're reading Pindar, um, mm -hmm. it's just like chock full of things, like lineages and everything, things that you cannot pick up if you don't know your like centaur family tree, <laughs> which I don't know that much right now. Yeah. Um, it's either, yeah, it's either that or satyrs in gay daddy culture or satyrs as daddies in gay culture. Wow. Because in antiquity, you have satyrs in the Silene that have, like, you know, the paunch bellies. They're older men. They're fairly gross. Like, the Silene especially are, like, they look kind of like uh, Danny DeVito. Yeah. Slightly <laughs> taller. <laughs> but no offense to Danny DeVito. I mean, no, he's actually a national yeah, treasure. He's, he's yeah, like, no, no, no. I say one that. of the best people out there. But yeah. But, yeah, <laughs> but he knows. Absolutely. It's like, <laughs> see, okay. see. But yeah, like you, you, you see porn now that's just like leaning into like the dad bod, like the older thing, and they're actually seen as a, a thing that, that you can be sexually attracted to. So I don't know which one. That's so uh, interesting. I, 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 the centaur one, the title, kind of be an annoying, like snippy title, long thing, but mm. like. Okay, it's, can you reference the version of Chiron where he has the full body of a man in the front with the horse on the back? Because yes. every time I mention that, then it's a big question of like, does he have two dicks? Does he have one of yeah. each? And it's only think, Chiron. Think, it's only sometimes. I, 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 because you have those archaic statues, right? Of centaurs also. There, there's mm. that one. 
I forget in what museum it's at. Because I'm picturing there's pottery of See. one where it's like literally just Chiron is like a full guy wearing the full outfit. And then he's got a horse butt coming off of him. And it's uh, like, Yeah, there's a statue of it. I think it's like 7th century or 6th century, oh, wow. like a bronze statuette. Ooh. <sighs> See, 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 I'll link it to you afterward. But yeah. he for sure is just like full man, human genitalia. And then I actually don't know if he also has. I, I've never like, I, yeah. I don't know if they have well, a 3D in the museum <laughs> and you can just go under and go like, oh, there you are. That's the thing in the pottery, you can't tell because he's like also mm -hmm. wearing everything. Yeah, so it's exactly. It's just a matter of like the imagination. But I love yeah. the idea that there's a statue too. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and that's like one of the questions. Like, because, because the centers are like that. It's this dynamic of the the rationality of the man mm -hmm. that's on top, and then you have like the the bestial, lustful component of the horse, which mm -hmm. is underscored by the horse have giant genitalia, <laughs> 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 like, uh, and 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 yeah, it ties into like. Like Apuleius, you have the golden ass. You have that scene mm -hmm. with the donkey. Uh, and and uh, see, so the ancients thought of this too. You have like, there's this Roman terracotta lamp that has, but I'm pretty sure it's just a farmer having relations with like a sheep or something. But you, like in agrarian societies, these topics, I'm not saying they're <laughs> like, I'm not giving assent to them, but I'm just saying in an agrarian society where you people are more like encountering animals all the time, these things just like yeah. happen and you see them more and more frequently in like texts and objects than we do today uh, for a variety of factors. One of them is, of course, the increase in urbanization where like people don't, and also just like it's bad <laughs> yeah feel the need to say that <laughs> yeah did you, did you see that aristotle quote with the otter thing oh. i almost like uh had a heart attack when i first saw it so let me see if i can get it right now so aristotle yeah there's a quote in his historia animalium that talks about the otters and i translated it the otter also bites humans and does not surrender so they say until it hears the crack of bone. <laughs> <laughs> That's Otters so are terrifying true. and also adorable. Yeah, it's why I like them. It's it's yeah. why I think they're the epitome of classics. Twitter. It's like people people can take a break for them, or, or, or like I can just be like this wicked witch of the west that just like summons otters to attack, like the furies or something, uh, to attack people. That's um, great. Yeah, no, it's just like, eh. and also like. We all need some brevity. Like, there's too many oh people God, that absolutely. take that seriously. Like, yeah, I write, I publish, like, I am an active scholar, but I don't feel the need to, like, you yeah. know, put on errors every four seconds or, or yeah, people know what I do. And that's not what Twitter's for. And if you're using yeah, well, it that it's way. social like, media. <laughs> yeah. Twitter's fun. Sí, yeah. exactamente. It, it doesn't have to be, like. Yeah, people should just take more hints from, like, the Cubans. You can make fun of things. Like, you can still hold reverence and, like, I mean, make fun I, of things. That's yeah. basically my podcast in a phrase. Oh, yeah, no. Absolutely. Like, people sometimes get mad at me and or like, how do you love them if you make, if you're, you know, insulting the gods so much? And I'm like, we can do both. They do ridiculous things. I'm not going to They're tell legitimately you, no. terrible. <laughs> they are. They're awful. And, like, I started my podcast because people who talk about greek mythology especially like in pop culture tend to just make them these like incredible like warm and fuzzy people like disney's hercules style which Gee. is like absurd and not based in mythology and the cool thing about them is that the, even the ancient greeks saw them as like complex and problematic and dangerous and yeah. weird and so i'm gonna yeah, do exactly <laughs> no and they also had a sense of humor about them like yeah. it's not like we're you can you can love something you can love studying something and you can maintain a sense of it, it's imperative that you maintain a sense of humor about it <laughs> yeah. because at the end of the day it is like they themselves thought that some of this stuff was was ridiculous like, the homeric came to hermes is the number one biggest proof of like oh. they also thought it was funny <laughs> see <laughs> Oh, baby Hermes. Uh, know, um, baby Hermes doing everything, stealing cows and yeah. faking footsteps. And... You can have a mixture 
of reverence to something and and still find humor in it like they are like my family catholic the kingdom come but like still you have to have humor about it and like so my my abuela still lights candles and everything and and sometimes she just goes she just shrugs and <laughs> goes maybe it'll work uh like <laughs> it's complex and and you can do humor while still loving it yeah like for example you were talking about um Disneyfication of some of these myths. Mm. You also have the thirstification mm-hmm. of of have you seen that new Hades game? Well, not new anymore. It's like a year and a half, two years old now. I've but, only seen people talking about it in screenshots and stuff, but yeah. <laughs> have you seen the character designs for them? They are begging. It is like thirst traps. Every character is a thirst trap. Uh, they and they knew they were doing that. Good on them. Hey, they're supposed to be like greater than human uh, um, uh, things, but they knew exactly. <laughs> I, and it worked out well for them. The, the, uh, the game's great, uh, and the developers have had a wonderful success with it. So, um, yeah. I've but it's for sure things. like Rule 34 trap. Yeah, you get, they know what the internet's going to do to it. You got to mm-hmm. find the way. I mean, this ancient world, we can do kind of, you know, what we need to to work around work with it i guess i don't know that's not particularly yeah, eloquent yeah um, and it happens too with video games mm. uh to a certain degree because you have for example like rome total war 2 so th- those are the type of games that i focus on when i do like our geo our geo gaming stuff well that and pokemon apparently but but like i focus more on the your bog standard strategy games because my research my main research is about like ancient states and the like Assassin's Creed has Sparta versus Athens and everything like that, but it doesn't have like how people conceptualize ancient states actually working. Mm-hmm. Like, what do they think the realities of ancient states is like? Like, how do they function and everything? And like, for example, in Rome, Total War Two, when you beat an army, uh, an enemy army, you have three choices. One of them is you take on captives and you replenish your troops by doing that if you lost any troops in the battle. I might be getting my total wars mixed up. Oh, yeah, one of them is like, you can release them. You can take captives, you can release them, kill them, or put them into slavery with one button. No, I'm not saying that is inherently, because I'm not a developer. I understand that game mechanics have to come first. And, and like the player experience has to come first. But we also have to think about how like something as complex as just enslaving people and generally negative, uh, as enslaving people gets gamified into clicking a button. Mm-hmm. And then the player is, it's usually bonuses because you get slaves and then your economy goes up, you get like public order. I understand that it's it's working within the game mechanics. I'm not saying like, oh, we should just mm-hmm. like cancel Rome Total War. It's useful to think about, to use these examples to think about how people think of antiquity and how it's received how superficially people think about ancient slavery or something like that or people that gamify it not only in terms of like video games but like economics like oh you have this number of slaves like just using people as numbers or viewing people as numbers efficiency or how to maximize work and not thinking about the the human suffering that contributes to it Mm -hmm. um so yeah the the, I'm, i'm writing a a blog posts for people in the past about that how how ancient state not about slavery in game mechanics i would love to do one about that but about like how ancient states are viewed like what traits if you play civ like rome gets a bath specific building and that means that usually means they get more population growth they get legionaries as special troops and they get bonuses to like fighting better so that naturally gives a militaristic and expansionist portrayal of Rome that influences the player's narrative. And so that's how they think of, like, it's just another popular reception. Mm -hmm. Um, Except this one's so much more complicated and intriguing, I think, personally, for me, because you have player choice and, and you have game mechanics being presented, factions being given, like, specific units to kind of distill them into their essence, at least what the developers think their essence is. But it's still in like the game mechanics, so they still have to function within it. So that's why I'm like always interested. Like, how are the Greeks portrayed? Oh, they get a special unit, the hoplite. Uh, no surprises there. 
but like they get bonuses to science because they have the academy building so they they research faster and you're going okay okay so they're they're like nerds and they can fight somewhat well if they have a so yeah stuff like that is is mm-hmm. super interesting to think about how it affects and like, plays on like perception. the the sort of general understanding of those two cultures too Right. Like the sort of yeah. inherent, the Greeks are smart and creative and the Romans are war, all about yeah. war. It's, exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And it drives these narratives and it's influenced by like research. For example, like in Rome, Total War II, Rome gets like manpower bonuses. So they, if they lose soldiers, they can get them back quicker. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, basically they can recuperate their losses quicker. And that has to do a lot with like research into the population of Italy and how that contributed to Roman expansion. P.A. Brunt's work on Italian manpower in the 70s, the the work of Walter Scheidel. But you can see it superficially, of course, because again, like, it's a game. The developers are constrained by the fact that they have to make something that people can actually play. You can Mm -hmm. put a bunch of numbers You can simulate a bunch of stuff, but at the end of the day, like, player experience comes first, so history has to be sacrificed to that. Yeah, you can totally see that. Um, I I study the Hellenistic empires in these games, and you went to Greece. I I don't know Mm -hmm. if you particularly saw, when I went to Greece uh, for the first time, I went to the American summer school, or excuse me, the ASCSA summer school in Athens two years ago, and we did a trip around a bunch of Greece, and we visited a bunch of museums, and I naturally gravitated towards uh, the material and Hellenistic stuff. And you still see this like, oh, the Hellenistic period is when Greek culture advances into the East. And you, you still have this like dominant narrative of Greeks going everywhere and just stamping their identity onto these places Mm -hmm. when it's such a more complicated period it's such a rich period for for cultural dynamic cultural interaction just like in people don't like in the video game in strategy games hellenistic empires typically have like bonuses to spread hellenistic culture they can only build greek temples dedicated to the greek pantheon Mm -hmm. But you have instances of Seleucid kings, of Ptolemaic kings and queens, of course, being patrons of native temples, of indigenous temples, like, mm-hmm. because that's just the way it doesn't work. Like the Greeks don't paint a, the map like in, in whatever color you want to ascribe to whatever Hellenic is as a culture. It's such, and I think that's what initially drew me to that period. So yeah, I, I guess maybe to like the Hellenistic period, it suffers from middle child syndrome, as as we we talked about briefly in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm so because... I am so guilty of that, which is why I'm so excited to have you on and talk about this because I'm like <laughs> I'm so all about archaic and classical, and for me it's because mm-hmm. of the mythology, right? Because most of the like more, mythology itself was developed back then. Of course, we have some right. incredible works from the Hellenistic period, but they're yeah. usually working off of older sources or older ideas. So I just tend towards those two. But of course, yeah, I mean, the Hellenistic period was super important and interesting. Yeah. And so, yes. First, can you give me a quick, for my listeners, and also to remind me, because my degree was so long ago now, <laughs> who are the Seleucids? <laughs> okay, so... The Hellenistic period begins, and this is the thing, periodization is horrible. Periodization, (laughs) but we need it because like human beings can only think of time in like chunks. Like time is such a crazy concept that that we have to divide. And and, like for scholarship also, you have to be a scholar of a period or something like that. It's just the way things work. So we have to very artificially do, this is the classical period, this is the Hellenistic period, this is the imperial period, when in actuality, it's all the same. Like Mm -hmm. time, time and people, Alexander died in 323, and that's the start of the Hellenistic period, traditionally the start of the Hellenistic period. But it's not like the world just went, aha, we are now in the hell. It's not like a a game of like, Civ Six. Age of mythology is my <laughs> reference point where you like upgrade and suddenly there you are. You're in the new age. You're in the yeah. Hellenistic period. All the buildings look a little bit more spruced up. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, 
But again, yeah, so the Hellenistic period is traditionally dated from 323, the death of Alexander, to 31 BCE, the Battle of Actium, and then Augustus's consolidation uh, mm. of Rome and, and the Eastern Mediterranean. So Hellenistic um, includes some time under Rome then? See, so... Interesting. I didn't know and, that. And that's one of the things I focus on, uh, because I focus on the Seleucids, and the Seleucids are one of the quote-unquote successor kingdoms mm -hmm. that occurred. So Alexander died in 323. The next 20 years is what I like to refer to my students as the Macedonian telenovela. Because, <laughs> oh my God, those 20 years after Alexander dies, it is some of the most confusing, plot-twisty, Game of Thrones, Red Wedding series chain of events there are so many contenders that are popping up everywhere people die all the time but then eventually in 301 uh, after a major battle you start seeing the the empires kind of settle down the borders somewhat remain uh, fairly fixed and you have basically three hmm, the big three. There's a, the big three. Quote, some Adelaide fanboys are going to hate me for this uh, by not including them in the big three. But you have the Antigonids. Um, they're in Macedonia. They eventually uh, gain a foothold there. You have the Seleucids. Uh, and then you have the Ptolemies. And those are kind of the big three. And then you have smaller kingdoms that are of equal import, uh, like Pyrrhus and Epirus, or the Adelids in Pergamon. But yeah, the Hellenistic period is defined by the fragmentation of Alexander's, uh, Alexander III's conquests, uh, because he might have been a good conqueror, he was not a good administrator. Uh, <laughs> and you need that, you know, to kind of maintain what you have. It's pretty uh, good proof why. what happened that, that yeah, that was sort of his way. Like, he died yeah, exactly. very young. He conquered a lot of land, died very young, and none of it really remained what he had. Exactamente. <laughs> So then you have the Hellenistic period, uh, is the, these larger kingdoms jostling for power, uh, smaller kingdoms around the periphery, they're still there, they still play a major part in politics. There's so much interaction between so many polities, not only in places like Asia Minor, Asia Minor is a hotbed, so much stuff happens in Asia Minor. But also in, in the Near and Far East, you have places like Ikanum, that's in Afghanistan, one of the, the farthest reaches of, of the Seleucids. And you have interactions with the Mauryan Empire in India. You have actual inscriptions that name Antiochus I and Ptolemy in India. Mm. Uh, it's crazy stuff. And in interactions with Central Asia, there's just so much there. But it does get buried under this just, you're a stepping stone on the way to Roman consolidation of the Mediterranean. And that's when stuff gets good, apparently. <laughs> uh, uh, not for a variety of peoples. Um, <laughs> it suffers from that. It also suffers from big men syndrome. You know, history is the history of big men, quote unquote. Because you have, of course, Alexander III, gigantic figure uh, at the beginning. And you have Cleopatra the Seventh at the very end. There's not a lot of it when people think of the Hellenistic period, they think of these two, and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why you have like a continuing thing about like who's going to be cast as Cleopatra. Like, there's so many other Cleopatras that are great. I think we can leave Cleopatra the Seventh alone for now. Do Cleopatra Thea, who was in like <laughs> a Seleucid queen, a Ptolemaic queen, but then she married into the Seleucids uh, dynasty mm -hmm. uh, from the 150s and on who survives like three husbands, uh, she, she kills one of them, to be fair. <laughs> and, and Best way to, to survive one, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. and, and one of my favorite things is, um, there's a quote in Appian, I believe, and he describes her as having an insane hatred for all of humankind. <laughs> so I, th I think if she was alive today, she would do like super great on Twitter. Yeah. I think she would be like an amazing poster on Twitter. Um, I mean, I really identify with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
it has a lot to do with modern scholarship, but also in like the Greeks and Romans themselves saw this period as kind of transitory when when you see Greek and Roman authors talk about Hellenistic kings and queens, it is usually with an insane amount of shade. They do not like them. They are rich. They are luxurious. They are Eastern, which is mm. the, the gasp in the conservative. Yes. Yeah, because they fall into this because their empires fell, as all empires do after a while. So they're not, you know, they're not special. But it's tied to these Greek and Roman perceptions of the East as a place of luxury, of corrupting luxury. Dionysus went there and he came back and he brought us some good stuff. But imagine if he brought us some good stuff, that place has to be filled with temptations and everything. He brought us winemaking. Like, great, that's great. But like the East has always been in the, the Greco-Roman imaginary, this place of like corrupting wealth. And also sexuality. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God. The the Hellenistic kings are are lusty, the queens are lusty. Um, so yeah, the, the Hellenistic period suffers from not only middle child syndrome in terms of modern audience, they, they just want to get to like the crazy Roman emperors and ah uh, it, aren't they crazy when you know Hellenistic kings and queens have had have been talked smack about. Uh, since antiquity, you know, where do you think they get all those stories? Kingship, uh, Hellenistic kingship and queenship, like the negatives, you see so many echoes of that in, in like in the Julia, like complaints about Julius Caesar wanting to become king, right? You see in all translation, it bothers me so much that in all translations of, you know, that famous scene in the Lupercalia when Antony presents the wreath to, okay. to Caesar three times and he's like, oh, you want to be king? And he says, no, 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 no. And the crowd applauds because the Romans don't like kings. And then Antony goes up and presents the, the crown again. And he goes, no, no, no. And the crowd claps even louder. And Antony for a third time tries to give him the wreath and Caesar refuses it for a third time. And then the crowd goes, yeah, he's refusing kingship. It's a diadem. And a diadem is this, most translations say wreath. And the diadem is this headband that's worn around the head of Hellenistic kings. Mm. It's purple, the color of kings, the color mm. of royalty, the color of money. Um, and you see this on coins and everything. And after that, statues of Julius Caesar around Rome, are uh, diadems are placed on them by, by people that don't like Caesar. They want to accuse him of trying to become a king. So like echoes of the Hellenistic period are everywhere. It shapes every single thing. Mm -hmm. But they it, it it gets so quickly buried under the the predominance of the classical period in how you said like the formative elements of of things like myth of the heyday of uh, the Spartans and and mm -hmm. the Athenians uh, but yeah you have like Pericles you have these things that people fixate on mm -hmm. no one talks about Athens in the fourth century like for long. Uh, so it's sandwiched in here. It's seen as a speed bump, but it influences so much of what happens later with Rome. And it influences, like, in terms of myth, you have an insane amount of new travel. You have people traveling all over because now you have these big empires. They want troops. They want settlers. They want people to fill the new cities that they're uh, creating. So they bring in people from all over, uh, especially from Greece, uh, but from all over. People place great emphasis on these foundations uh, and, and like a Seleucid foundation in Seleucia Tigris. And most of the people living there were actually just natives, like indigenous people of the area that were brought into the city. But mm -hmm. still in like general treatments of the period, in, in the books that people read, in like the history, like general history books, this period is just seen as, oh, Hellenistic culture comes in to areas where it had not reached afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that's not how culture works. Like mm -hmm. people are not just passive recipients of culture. If you see, if you see a statue with imagery that's familiar to you, you rationalize it in your head based on your value sets of your lived experiences. You bring that into your interpretation of something, which is why, for example, 
I study coins. Coins are great. Mm. Um, it, it, for example, in Cilicia, in the 120s, Tarsus gets to a city called Tarsus gets to mint its own coins. The Seleucid kings let them mint coins. It's called municipal coinage. And the figure that they opt to put on their coins is Sandan, which is a Hittite god mm. that's still worshipped in that area. Yeah. Even after, right? Like in the 120s BCE, you mm-hmm. see this Hittite god still there. And it influence, and that influence keeps on going into the Roman period where you see him subsumed with Zeus and uh, Heracles especially. So people just like aren't just there. Greek culture isn't a thing to be imparted on people. It is mm-hmm. present there. We can't we can't just go, oh, these empires are like benevolent. No, but any empire is not the like mm-hmm. really any state administration is not benevolent. They just want to extract resources from you. But still, it, it's it's a period of so much cross cultural interaction, give mm-hmm. and take, and you see this not only in coins but in inscriptions too. One of my favorites that I bring up in classes is you have a, the city of Sidon in Phoenicia. I believe this inscription is dated to the 3rd century, late 3rd century, I believe. It's this guy, Diotimos. He gets honored by the city, a Phoenician city, for being the victor of the chariot races in the Nemean Games. Um, and in that inscription, Sidon's going, ah, now the Greeks know the name Sidon. Because you have this increase in Pan-Hellenic games during the Hellenistic period, everybody wants to, well, local elites especially, want to be part of this greater conversation of like, what is it to be Hellenic? What is it to be Greek? So you have the city honoring this guy who won a chariot race. And in the end, the city of Sidon makes a little a little reference to Cadmos, the founder of Thebes, because he is said to be from Sidon. Mm -hmm. So you have a Phoenician city, Mm -hmm. like grabbing these traditions, these Greek mythical traditions, and like weaving it into their civic identity. Okay, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I keep going, but also I have questions. (laughs) No, go for it. Uh, Shoot, because I have a tendency to ramble on. No, 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 I can talk about this. I mean, it it shows that... (laughs) It's one of my favorite things, though, is just getting people like you talking about the thing that you know so well it's it's the best but you said cadmus <laughs> which means now i have questions so i was gonna Shoot. ask this regardless and then you started talking about phoenicia and cadmus so i really had to so he is my favorite who i talk about in passing on the podcast a lot but have rarely covered because there's not a ton in terms of like full stories about him but he's my right. favorite because i got into classics as a is an actual like field of study because 14 years ago I started writing a novel about Cadmus Harmonia and Harmonia on a whim really? and so they're like my complete origin point for everything <laughs> I have today I've still not finished the novel it's now become something completely different that still features them <laughs> um, so he's such a fascinating figure for me and I love to hear that that he ended up kind of like being utilized again in, in Phoenicia in that way yeah there is an increase, especially in the Hellenistic period, because again, interconnected is a very loaded term. Mm. But it is the Mediterranean became increasingly interconnected um, after the Hellen- in, during the Hellenistic period because you have so many people moving to and fro. You have yes, elites visiting. You have wandering poets going from town to town that you see in honorary inscriptions, and you also get a bunch of local cults that seek recognition. Um, One of my favorites has to do with uh, Artemis, and this is on Magnesia on the Meander. So this Mm. is in Asia Minor still. Asia Minor, there's a lot of evidence for just because there's a lot of temples in Asia Minor. Also, they really like to write things down. There's an epigraphic habit, um, Mm. the land of the chattering stones. But you have, for example, yeah, that Artemis appears in the third century. There's an epiphany of that Artemis. She appears, and then the people there go to different polities to seek recognition for that epiphany of Artemis in their area because they want to create a festival, a Panhellenic festival, and they want people from other cities to come and recognize. There's an increase in that. You start seeing a bunch of festivals um, for these like local cults that want bigger like recognition. They want to attract more people from all around. And they even, we have an inscription, they sent a, a, 
a letter to the Seleucid king asking for recognition, asking for a delegation there. Uh, and you have these sacred embassies, the Theoroi, who are like, yeah, they're sacred embassies. They, they, they go to the courts of Hellenistic kings and they go, hey, do you want to like give some money or like attend our festival? And usually they'll give something um, because that's one of the main ways that Hellenistic kings can influence a region is by the system of patronages. So temples and, and the favoring of temples, the recognition of temples becomes another way that yeah, that you see, the, you see the the collation of local traditions or local myths, especially they they sometimes get greater recognition. Conversely, uh, for example, uh, you have temples in Central Asia under territories in the Seleucids that have that probably had a cult statue to Zeus in the middle. But there's become a, there's increasing evidence that there's also local indigenous worship. Alongside the statue of Zeus, their temples have little niches, indents in them, where you have like water vessels that were probably used for local religious rites, coinciding along a, a temple that had this like cultic statue to Zeus, and Zeus was a big figure in like the imperial quote unquote uh, pantheon of the Seleucids. So you do certainly see like a, an emphasis on the local variations there's another epiphany later on in the 40s that zeus actually comes to the battlefield and like stops an army from rampaging uh and he, yeah it's so weird he like envelops a mist he like makes the enemies think that dogs are barking off in the distance uh and just confuses the heck out of the the parthians that are invading that region um that's very cool yeah but like there's for people that are super into myth there's so much that continues on, not evolves, that changes and adapts uh, to, to like the political situations going on in the Hellenistic period where you have people and empires just vying for control over regions. So like they'll grant things to temples, temples will have a greater role to play the gods. Like, and, 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 yeah, and like, heck, you even have mythos around like rulers, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Seleucid mythos, the Seleucus, the first mythos is especially like, pertinent um and stuff like that so myth is used in so many ways not only it's not only the greeks coming in and like oh you have uh, i don't know artemis over here or something like that no you also have like local indigenous people that still have their own deities that they worship living alongside worshiping alongside participating in festivals alongside Mm -hmm. uh, the the Hellenistic pop or the the Greek populations that are in these areas. Yeah, you don't have to be a Greek to enjoy a festival. It's so <laughs> interesting that I think it's just it, it's such a fascinating comparison to obviously like the more modern examples of empire and things and the way yes. that like it became about wiping out the old culture versus like having a new one live alongside it like i just think of you know imperialism in north america and yeah <laughs> like i mean as somebody from canada it's a huge part of our lives especially right, right now because my country is continuing to find horrible mass graves of children at residential yes. schools that that were just a, a complete government and widespread attempt to actually wipe out a culture like systematically wipe out a culture yes. and it's so interesting and obviously refreshing to hear of like yeah i mean obviously these empires weren't great and there's always problems yeah. attached to it but at the same time they weren't going there trying to wipe out the existing culture no. and implement greek instead it was like no we're gonna bring our greek stuff and we're gonna all kind of coexist you know, that's probably a, it's a nicer sounding term than probably <laughs> what it was, but ultimately yeah, still, like, yeah, yeah it, it's like, there's a little bit of everything in an interesting way. Yeah. At the, like at the end of the day, the state still held the monopoly on violence. Yeah. Like they still <laughs> held, they, they, they still had the army, but mm -hmm. that's just not the way ancient states worked because they're limited in their, their, their application, like their ability to press down on you is mm -hmm. so much more limited than like modern empires, modern nation states where they can just seep into every single thing you do. Like ancient states, they didn't have, they didn't have the technology, they didn't have the resources to really get into, they didn't have the, ment the mentality really. That, like, that was going to be my question, yeah. yeah. 
Because I think also a huge part of, well, I mean, not I think, but definitely a huge part of certainly in North America is it's just Christianity, right? It's like the viewpoint that Christianity is the one and thus yeah. we must wipe out indigenous. Whereas mm -hmm. I don't think that ancient religious structures had that same mentality of like, yours is wrong and ours is right. Yeah. It's like newer scholarship has emphasized. So the Seleucids are famed, not for much. But they're certainly famed for their part in the the revolt of the Jewish peoples. Um, mm. The the famous Hanukkah story, the famous like quashing of of the Jewish peoples during the reign of Antiochus IV. Um, Interesting. And you know how little I know about <laughs> religion. I'm like, oh, I mean, really? I, 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 have like, I have thoughts. <laughs> I have opinions, uh, especially on the reception of the Seleucid state in the Rugrats Hanukkah special. <laughs> they they did my boy Antiochus dirty. Um, That's some niche millennial content that I'm <laughs> here for. <laughs> but like, now, now it's becoming clear because the, our sources are all Jewish. They, of mm -hmm. course, do not like the Seleucids. They're writing after everything happens and they want to provide a nice, tidy narrative that gives a nationalist like, oh, this is who we are and it was us against them. When in the reality, it was much more blurry. It wasn't that the Seleucids, because they this is not their policy. This is not what they do. They don't go into a region and go, you cannot worship these gods. You must worship the Hellenic gods. Mm -hmm. That is not how that works. That That is how that works in like Rome Total War. When you're playing as the Seleucids, uh, you want to have Greek culture everywhere. And people mm -hmm. gamify ancient empires like this, even not in games, but they think it's a zero sum game of religion and culture and myth when it's mm -hmm. not. Everything can get into a wonderful quagmire. And for example, the, the Jewish revolt, there were factions inside of Judea that were vying for control. And one of them sought to get the support of the Seleucid king. And what's the best way to do that? Show that you're like a Greek. Like have a little bath or have a little, yeah, have a little bath, have a little Hellenic temple at the Zeus, because that's just the easiest way. That's the path of least resistance to occupying an area or to like governing an area. If you have an elite class that is quote unquote Hellenized, that follows Greek customs, it's just easier to do business with them because they're from a same like cultural, or at least they're, they're in concert with similar like language and value sets that you are so antiochus just went oh why shouldn't i support these guys that it's going to be easier to govern in a region that's like in the border because they just recently acquired that from the ptolemies mm. yeah exactly so like why not have a, a they're still like he's still the high priest uh he there's still like jewish religion it's just that they want to adopt Hellenic customs. And then the Seleucid king going, okay, why not? So he champions them. But then in later historiography and later writing, that conflict gets simplified because mm. you want a tidy narrative of us versus them, especially when the kingdom of Judea becomes like a thing. And yeah, like all the Hellenistic kingdoms, empires, whatever you want to call them, suffer from this. Uh, that Greco-Roman authors and, and Jewish authors for the Seleucids, um, just like, disdain them to no end because the winners write the history right mm -hmm. but yeah that's a, that's one of the things that contributes to this but this oversimplification uh also this period is so rich uh for those that are interested in myth um mm -hmm. so rich to study because you see myth interacting in so many different aspects um especially in the material culture like you have to love material culture to be in this period um there's not a lot of literature that survives. Um, I think that's what I struggle with because yeah. as a storyteller, it becomes more difficult See. versus, yeah, like like this style of looking at it from a more like a broader like historical context of the, mm -hmm. the mythos and everything. Yeah. Um, but a good example and well-timed came up at the time of this recording because I don't know when I'll release it. But the time of this recording, my last episode was on Memnon. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the story of the Trojan War, and then also just generally the way the Greek mythology understood Africa. And mm -hmm. somebody commented on on a post I had about it 
mentioning a source they'd found where uh, Memnon is said to have teamed up with uh, Indian troops and traveled mm. to Troy. And that was really interesting because, you know, I immediately saw see that and think like, okay, well, that's coming from Hellenistic or later because it, I mean, just generally they knew what India was. <laughs> so, you know, they've, yeah. they've got that reference point. But it's so interesting to see the way that it can come and meld into earlier stories once they have all these reference points of these regions beyond. And it's like, okay, well, you know, we are now very familiar with India and the Indian people. And so mm -hmm. let's combine it with this existing story. Let's put India into the Trojan War. Like, so fascinating to see that the the way these things are sort of reinterpreted to account for new knowledge, I guess. Yeah, like the the Dionysus's famed expedition to the east gets recontextualized once Alexander gets there. Yeah, uh, and and after Salute, um, there's a, a recent book on like Seleucid literary production because mm. when you think of the Hellenistic period, you see this in memes all the time. It's always the Library of Alexandria, and the Library of Alexandria was a huge center. I'm not downplaying the role of the Library of Alexandria, pero there's a lot. There's other libraries: the Library of Pergamon, the Library of Antioch. Actually, there's there's uh, a little snippet. I forget where it is, but Antiochus the first actually invites a poet called Eratos to go to the Library of Antioch to go to Antioch and write a commentary for the Iliad. So mm -hmm. it's it's yeah it's it's all this stuff like there's so much in terms of like the literary transmission of the Iliad, commentaries on the Iliad, how the Iliad is received um, in Hellenist in the Hellenistic period that gets simplified to the Alexandria discourse, to, to, to the deficit of like other people interacting with this, like social imaginaries, uh, how it forms notions of like space. And Antiochus III went to Ilion and, and did a little thing to Athena, uh, some uh, throwback to um, the Iliad, but all you hear about is Alexander doing that. Mm. But yeah, it's just like, yeah. I really like this period. <laughs> yeah. No, but it is so fascinating also just the way that certain people and things and time periods um, really end up standing out. And you got to kind of, I mean, wonder why and whether it was like entirely in the ancient world or also modern construction. But yeah, I mean, the way that Alexander stands out above everyone. And like, I know it's because he, you know, went to all these places, but he didn't live very long or do very much. With a small loan of an incredibly well polished army from his papa. Well, yeah, uh, exactly. It's not like yeah. he, you know, like he he was a, a rich boy who had like just went and, I mean, he, you could connect him with so many modern notions of, of yes. people. You know, <laughs> he was a very rich boy who inherited a lot from his father, including the kingdom itself, and then just mm -hmm. went and like used his money to just expand with no understanding of what he would do once he had expanded. And yeah. then everything blew up because of that. When you die young and you haven't prepared for what's going to happen after you die, well, everyone's kind of fucked. <laughs> some, some like uh, Alexander scholars uh, somewhere off in the distance uh, just like crane their head and go, someone's talking smack because he's a Absolutely. darling. Can't talk. Also, yeah. I'm talking all of this with very little concrete knowledge and truly all just like the way that my brain is able to like take in tiny things over time and then <laughs> talk like I know what I'm talking about. But I mean, it's like... The way he is the biggest, and then Cleopatra, like you were saying earlier, and the Library of Alexandria, the way these are the things that everyone talks yeah. about when so much else existed that, like, objectively could be seen as the same level of importance overall or what have you. Um, yeah. It's just fascinating. And the way that these certain people, like, capture the imagination or time periods, like, the way that classical Greece has completely, is, like, sort of the be-all and end-all of Greece when when you're not, you know, necessarily a scholar, but certainly I, I'm sure among scholars too. Right. Ugh, nerds. 
Thank you, as always, for listening. This conversation was so much fun. We talked for over two hours, and even then I could have listened to even more about all of this. Like, I literally unfortunately had to go. <laughs> it was all just so fascinating and there's so much to take in about the whole time period and the region and just gods, there's so much there. During this period, the Greeks traveled so far and they took over so many places so far east and south. So there's just so much more insight into all these ancient regions because of this. And I was so fascinated to hear about how much they kind of like melded their Greek traditions and practices and gods with the same pieces from those other regions. Super cool. I'm so used to thinking of primarily Hellenistic Egypt and the Ptolemies, or just Alexander generally, that when I consider the Hellenistic period. So hearing about all of these kings and regions that are far beyond Greece and Egypt and Rome is so eye-opening. I could talk about it all forever, just emphasizing how interesting all of this is and how much I just consistently want to know more about all of it. But hey, luckily, there's another episode of this Hellenistic wonder. So stay tuned. Next Friday, we hear more about the Hellenistic period and all their myths and kings and so much more. Make sure you follow Eduardo on Twitter, not least because he's incredibly funny on Twitter and shares lots of otter photos. There's a link in the episode's description, as always. Let's Talk About Myths, Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos to editing and research and so much more. And we have an intern this month. How cool is that? Grace Roby is helping out with loads of things. When I'm recording this, she hasn't actually started yet, so I can't be specific, but I just know <laughs> she's going to be great. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. I fucking love learning this stuff, and I truly will never get over how much you all love it too, how you as listeners help me keep this up, keep speaking to scholars and learning new and fascinating things, helping scholars share their work beyond the confines of academia, all of it. Thank you all so much for listening and continuing to listen. It's been fucking life-changing. I am Liv, and I absolutely love this shit so fucking much. Mm -hmm.